Let's begin together with a prayer. Please bow our heads. Dear Jesus, we are so grateful, uh, the same as we sing in this song, there is a beautiful sunshine. And you gave us sunshine of the day for this uh, Sabbath day. Thank you for the sunshine that you gave us in our hearts. Thank you for, for the light that we can see and walk and follow. Dear Jesus, we are so grateful that uh, you also give light in various way and some of them we will see and will be inspired with those even now. We would like to ask you for your present for this evening and please be, uh, please be with us and give us Holy Spirit so you can lead us in a way so we can do whatever is uh, your will. Uh, please do it according to your will. Amen. Okay, so uh, right now we are starti starting networking, uh, excuse me, uh, ministry spotlight session. And uh, we, will, we would like to present you uh, two uh, ministries. One will be from video, and the second from the video. And we have also visitors that are online and waiting to present this ministry by themselves. So let us start with the first one uh, related to uh, ministry, um, Matenson Ministry Mission School. So uh, Jeremy Zwicker, who is part of the uh, organization, uh, organization group. He prepared a, a video to present uh, this ministry, Mat Matenson School in Norway. So I would like to ask technician to start this video. In 1960, 31% of the baptisms in our church were in Global North and 69% in Global South. How had this situation changed by 2014, 54 years later? A massive increase in baptisms in Global South had enlarged their percentage to 97%, leaving Global North with a shockingly small 3% in the US, Canada, Europe, Russia and Australia combined and only half a percent of the baptisms were in Europe. Europe has always been known for sending out missionaries to the third world countries in times past, but has now become one of the greatest mission fields. Some have started calling Europe the post-Christian triangle. The Grandheim Foundation is dedicated to supporting Matheson Mission School, which trains missionaries for life and gives them a vision for serving God with all their time, talents and resources. In a family atmosphere and in an inspiring learning environment, Matheson Mission School empowers young people who wish to come closer to God and find his plan for their lives. The training takes place in various learning arenas, the classroom, the kitchen, the garden, the local community, and in team activities. The simple yet comprehensive principles of Christian living are promoted and careful examination and independent thinking encouraged. Students are taught to form habits that promote Christian integrity. To make the training more effective, the Granheim Foundation seeks to create a model of sustainable evangelism. In order to do this, it operates a compass production plant and a local lifestyle club in cooperation with the local church. It also networks with local Adventist businesses that function as centers of influence. May the Lord help us reach more neighborhoods in the post-Christian triangle. We want to thank God for the way he has led in the past and trust he will accomplish this work through us in the future. Good evening, everyone. Crazy, huh? Crazy numbers. These low baptisms here in Europe, it's, been a, it's become a, a huge missionary field here in Europe, where you are. And it seems like these seeds don't want to grow here. And 
Yeah, praise the Lord. At Matheson this year, we had five of our students deciding to go and be baptized. Amen? Amen. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. Yes. So it's really nice. Um, but the, yeah, and as you saw, at Matheson, we also have this agriculture program. And praise the Lord, you're doing an agriculture conference. And that's really inspiring. I've been watching part of it. And uh, yeah, but I want to ask Darta here that is leading the agriculture here at Matheson. What are we doing in, here at Matheson? Yeah, we are having both a garden and also a greenhouse just here to the left from us. And um, in the greenhouse, we grow actually a lot of tomatoes, different varieties. And outside we focus mainly on root vegetables and greens. And uh, also we grow basil, which, which is amazing for pesto. What is the purpose of actually agriculture or having it in the program? Yeah, as, um, as in any place, of course, it's wonderful to grow your own food. And there is nothing like a slice of sun ripened tomato on your toast in summertime or in the fall, but here, it's also a great blessing to to have it as a classroom. It's one of our main classrooms. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's a great blessing and a joy to see our students that have probably never touched the soil at all in their <laughs> life properly and gotten their hands dirty, to see them actually coming and learning things and enjoying it, mm -hmm. which is a big surprise for them yeah, yeah. many times. That's right. And um, the best thing is that we also see them growing. Mm -hmm that they report that they have grown in patience and endurance and also mm. faith in God and, yes. and reliance on yeah, Him. Very true, I've seen that yeah. many times as well. So how have these last two seasons been different than previous seasons? Right, they have been very different in that sense that we have a lot less workforce, <laughs> which is a great mm. blessing for the garden, but it's also a blessing for the students, as I mentioned, to have that experience. Uh, but this year and last year, some of the students unfortunately couldn't return um, back to Norway after the mission internship mm, yes. and they have been participating distantly and doing some practical work there but here mm. we have gotten a lot less help and I have to be honest sometimes it has been somewhat overwhelming to mm. think how are we going to finish this yeah. but to see that God is blessing nevertheless and and doing so much for us and for example through the weather you know, this season it hasn't been too hot and dry and that's a great blessing. We save a lot of time mm. that we would otherwise spend watering. And even now, <laughs> we even took on the project to plant new strawberries mm -hmm. last week. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, Yeah. so uh, what are your plans for this summer? Yeah, my <laughs> just a side note. <laughs> <laughs> my plans, my main plans are to get married. <laughs> Amen. That's very nice. But other than that, I, yeah, I'm enjoying working here and will work Yes. faithfully as long as I can Amen. while I'm preparing for my wedding. <laughs> That's very nice. Yeah, so a, a question to you, like, would you like to come and participate in this kind of training? So maybe it's not you that are at the conference, but maybe you are at the conference. But if a friend that you know or you are at the conference, you can still apply for this season if you put into the application, if you go on matheson.no and put in the application, OCI Agriculture Conference then you can get still be able to apply to come to Madison so remember that OCI Agriculture Conference and you can recommend somebody and in addition to that they don't have to pay the, agri uh, the agriculture fee no the, the <laughs> application fee so uh, yeah we, we look forward to seeing more of you and uh, to end with we will stop with this this uh, short snippet of grow your faith <laughs> your faith uh, I don't know if Jeremy is, watch Jeremy is watching but I would like to thank you to, for preparing uh, such a uh, beautiful inspirative uh, inspiration for uh, seeing how mission could be done uh, within education uh, I think everybody heard such some interesting offers so we would like to start uh, to be trained within this uh, mission school uh, 
uh, yeah, just use it. Just don't forget uh, OCI, uh, Agriculture Conference, to sign at the application. <laughs> OK, uh, we have another uh, uh, ministry spotlight. And this ministry spotlight is really, really interesting. It's coming from United States. Uh, I don't know if you called something related to Feed Challenge Ministry that will be presented now. We will start with the promotion video and we have a, a even a director or the, the one who start this mission program online. So we will speak to us directly. So first the video and then technician will connect us with uh, himself together with probably his colleague Ludo. I don't know if he's uh, still there, but we'll see. So video first, uh, uh, a promotion video, and then the, uh, some talk about how the, how the agriculture can be combining with medical missionary work. About 83 Americans die from heart disease and stroke every hour. 88 million adults in the U.S. are pre-diabetic, and more than 84% of them don't even know they have it. At least 2.8 million adults die each year as a result of being overweight or obese. As stated by the CDC, these lifestyle diseases and others may increase your risk of severe illness if you become infected with the novel coronavirus. Are you a slave to medications and recurring doctor's visits? Are you stuck in the same round of seemingly unbreakable habits, hoping that someday things will be different? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Do you want out? Good intentions are fine, as far as they go. But you will eventually have to make the choice to take a chance, or your life will never change. According to an article published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, Diseases associated with poor diet and lifestyle choices, such as diabetes and cancer, are the leading causes of death in America. Are you ready to choose to change? Then it's time for you to take the 10-Day Fit Challenge. Fit stands for Food Inspiring Total Transformation. Scientific studies have made it clear that a whole food, plant-based diet, like the one we will provide for you, can boost the immune system, fortifying your body against infectious diseases, including viruses. Our body is designed to heal itself, and it will heal itself, given the right conditions. During the 10-day challenge, we will make personalized recommendations that will create the conditions needed for your body to let the healing begin. Here's what you can expect. First, we will take you through a comprehensive health consultation to ensure that you have an experience adapted to your specific needs. Second, you will be assigned to a health coach from our worldwide network of health nutrition consultants. They will be there to answer questions, offer counsel, and ensure that you have a safe, effective, and enjoyable experience. And third, we will design a plan specifically for you. In this program, you will receive an exercise regimen uniquely aligned with your health goals private and group classes that feature life-changing science-based education and dynamic culinary workshops. And lastly, 
a unique nutrition program which includes fresh picked organic produce in the true spirit of farm to table. A skilled chef who will create delicious, life-giving meals and fresh pressed juices. These meals will be delivered to your home or business daily. Besides bringing you daily meals, we will also take a trip with you to the grocery store where you will learn how to analyze food labels as well as pick the best produce for your future meal plans. This plant-based diet can help with weight loss, boosting immunity, and detoxing from the various toxins that bombard us every day. This challenge is geared toward your success, leading you to a restoration of the whole being, mentally, physically, spiritually. Here are a few stories of past participants who have gone through the program. Listen to how they have been encouraged and transformed by this 10-day challenge. The 10-day challenge is hopefully a springboard to a lifestyle change that I'm planning on making. Um, I recently was diagnosed with breast cancer and it really opened my eyes to um, my health and the way I'd been living my life. And um, I want to be around for my family, my friends, um, and the world. So I think that um, this 10 day challenge, so far I'm on day three, and um, I did the two day detox to start out with. I've already lost four pounds, and my energy level has skyrocketed. Um, I, I just can't believe how much energy I have from eating a plant-based diet and how I don't feel lethargic from eating the processed foods that I was eating before because I definitely didn't think it was gonna go that way. Um, and I've started eating the vegan plan today, and again, I worked in the yard all day, and. And, um, I didn't run out of energy, I didn't feel hungry, and I feel nourished and whole. And I think if I continue to apply these uh, lessons that I've learned through the program um, throughout the rest of my life, that'll definitely help out with um, not, not ever having cancer again, which is what my goal is, and getting healthy, and losing a little bit of weight. To find out more about the 10-day challenge or to sign up for the next program, contact us today. Why wait for a better life tomorrow when you can have it today? It's time to let the healing begin. Isn't, isn't it beautiful, Combine uh, new uh, bringing new start directly to people? Uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Gabriel McClover. Hopefully, he's, I would like to ask technician to join him. Okay, they are working on this. Uh, Gabriel McClover, uh, he's, a, he's a founder of, of this mission and uh, Right now, if I recall well, I think they are working right now uh, a huge project together with the coal porters in the state of Michigan, I guess. But he will tell more about it. Okay. Okay. I think we see him. Okay. So welcome. Uh, welcome, Gabriel. Uh, would you like to introduce and yes, also uh, Ludo Prickler? Hello. <laughs> uh, would, can uh, you hi, everybody. Hello. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you very well. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. We can hear you. We can hear you. Wonderful. You. Okay. Can you introduce you your mission? Now. Okay. Just gonna. Yeah. Can you introduce your mission? So good evening, everyone. Good evening. 
Yeah. Can you, are we good? Are we good? Yep. Are you, are you, can you good. hear us? Okay. Yes, we can hear. What thing? So Perfect. I'm happy and privileged to be with Gabriel here. And uh, I just wanted to tell a quick story. We had a couple coming to visit us in Arizona and uh, the wife, she was a little sick. So we were doing a little 10 day challenge for her, 10 day kind of detox program. And her husband, he to told us that he knows uh, Gabriel doing this 10 day challenge like lifestyle on the wheels. And after many years, finally, we were able to meet and now we are together in Minnesota. And I will let Gabriel to tell you the rest of the story. Yes. So it is a pleasure to be in Europe, even, although I'm in the United States. <laughs> um, technology is a wonderful thing. Uh, and I want to talk just a little bit about the, the Fit Challenge. So you guys saw the promo video and uh, we've been utilizing that promo video. We've been actually running this program since the year 2016. My wife and I have a restaurant in Somerville, Georgia, called the Vineyard Vegetarian Cafe and Juice Bar. And agriculture, we have been passionate about agriculture since we joined the church about since 2015 or 2016, we joined the church, Adventist Church, and we've been passionate about agriculture. So when we started growing all these different foods and things, um, the Lord opened the door for us to open a restaurant. And I was 10 years in corporate America. And I said, well, how do we, uh, how do we, uh, how do we, uh, you know, uh, control margins and things like that. So I'm looking at it from a business perspective and I saw that if I can grow my own food and bring it to the restaurant and sell it, that I can control the margin from seed to plate. And so here we are in a little small town, 4,000 population, we embarked on this uh, restaurant journey. And then as we were doing research, we found two very important things that people in our community needed to go to a lifestyle center, a wellness retreat. But there were two big problems. One, they could not afford it. It was too much money. Uh, and that was one problem. The second problem is most people cannot take off 7, 10, 21 days off of work and still, uh, and still have a job when they come back. So as us, as we started this restaurant concept, we said, you know what? How about we just take the lifestyle center to them? So we said, okay, how do we do it? I said, well, we have the food. So what we did was say, let's bring the food to them. And so this is where this, this, this idea happened. And so from our restaurant, we started preparing meals and delivering food to people, putting them on a fit, what we call a fit challenge. We start off with a health consultation. We have these different um, sets of meetings, educational meetings. We have cooking classes. We actually go in people's homes and do private cooking lessons. Um, we take people to the grocery store. We teach them how to shop. Um, we, 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 what I like to say is at the very core of what we do is we love on people and we feed them healthy food. That's essentially what it is. And I love agriculture. You know, a few years ago, we had spoke at, at AGRA, Adventist Agriculture Association, and we did about, I think, six hours of lectures, really um, talking about the 10 day challenge, talking about how we combine agriculture with the restaurant work. And it's been powerful. And since then, the Lord has opened doors for us to travel to different parts of the world, uh, not, of the United States, not the world yet, to actually run these programs. So we go to places, and right now we're here in um, Minnesota. And we're partnering with the Minnesota Conference of Seventh-day Adventism, Adventism. They're having their uh, summer canvassing program. So here we are uh, a few months ago. I, I talking to the canvassing leader here. And I said, how about, he, he, he started talking to me, he saw the promo video. He says, how do, how do you think this will connect with a GLOW mission or a, or a, or a literature evangelism uh, type summer program? And I said, I think um, you will see uh, something <laughs> that you would never see before. So here we are in Minnesota. So we did a GLOW mission. Um, we did a GLOW mission in, um, in, in Rochester, Minnesota about a month ago. And um, we can share, we, we created a promo video for that as well, that experience. And this was powerful, how the Lord used us, we sharing glow tracks as, all, as well as the fit challenge. And we started to see some significant gains in a short period of time. So here we are in the summer, we're gonna be here all summer running this program. And I love this quote in evangelism page 122, paragraph four. It says, let every worker in the master's vineyard study plan, devise methods to reach people where they are. 
We must do something out of the common course of things. We must arrest the attention. We must be deadly in earnest. We are on the very verge of the times of troubles and perplexities that are scarcely dreamed of. So God is, is, is requiring of us to look at our particular environment and how can we arrest people's attention. Now we know the health message is the right arm of the gospel. And if you don't have good, high quality, nutritious food, the body won't heal itself. So at the very core of our program, we get organic vegetables grown from our Adventist growers out here. And we take that produce and then we go and we put people through a 10 day challenge. And then guess what? After the 10 day challenge, you have what you call an educated buyer. And what an educated buyer does, they like to pay premium price for high quality produce. So what we then in turn do is turn them right back to the Adventist grower. Hey, if you want to continue eating this good nutritious food, we have a farmer that you can go and you can get a box weekly actually delivered to you. How does that sound? They're like, sign me up. So this is, this is a way, and most farmers can tell you this, and as we go to Adagra and things like that, we, we talk to farmers and what they say, we can grow a lot of food. We can grow a lot of food, but marketing it and getting it to get into people's hands is always a challenge. So what we wanna do is to encourage folks out there to reach people where they at, devise methods. And I believe the Fit Challenge is a tool that can be used We've worked with over a thousand people, 60 to 70% of the people who go through this program, about 68% request Bible studies. Um, we went through churches and, and launched this program. Within 10 days, we, we've had uh, uh, Bible studies, women small group Bible studies set up. We've had, we've had cooking classes, health ministry stuff just set up just off of this program. So we're very excited about it. And the Lord, since COVID has exploded this, this side of our business, to the point where we actually created a different organization, Fit Challenge. We have coaches all over the all over the world. We actually have a few in Europe, a couple in France, and Canada and the United States. So, if you want to be a part of this ministry, we need health coaches. We need people who are who are interested in helping people virtually. Uh, we got people from Europe coaching people in the United States. This is powerful. How we can utilize technology to win more souls to Christ. So, and we also have a mobile app as well. The Lord has blessed that we have an app that people, when they're going through the program, they communicate with their coaches. So again, um, I can go on and on, but I just wanted to give you a high level of what Fit Challenge is. And who knows, you know, I don't believe nothing is by chance. You know, I love, there's a quote that I love. It says, it says, move no faster than the unmistakable providence of God opens the way. So here we are presenting at OCI here in Agricultural Conference in Europe. Um, there may be somebody there that says, hey, you know what, this may be a program that we want to try out over here. And we're just crazy enough to do whatever the Lord says. So with that, um, if you want to contact us, um, you can reach out to us at, uh, uh, you can go to info at fitt-challenge.com, info at fitchallenge.com. Um, you can um, also, if, if you have uh, WhatsApp, uh, you can reach me on WhatsApp. My phone number is 954-288-6335. Um, and yeah, and uh, we, we love to, to share our ideas because we truly believe the Lord is coming back soon. And we know when the health message is used in this right perspective, we're going to see the movements. Uh, we're going to see these movements rapid. And we've seen what happened with COVID. Everything shut down really, really quickly. But the thing they allowed Think about this, brothers. The thing that they allowed during COVID and all the lockdowns was food delivery. So here we are during COVID. People says, what do you guys do as a restaurant? We kept on going. We were delivering food all over the place, even though the countries were in lockdown. Because why? People need to eat. So this is a way that the Lord has set this up, that we, no matter what's going on, that we can continue to operate and shed the word, share the word of God. So with that... I appreciate you guys allowing us to have this uh, this forum to speak to you guys. And we pray that you continue to have a blessed conference over there in Europe. So God bless. Okay, okay. so thank you very much for uh, Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. Gabriel.
for uh, introducing your program. It was really amazing. We can just say big amen for that. Amen. Uh, it looks like uh, there are this is a TGM also mission school, and they also pre prepare lots of and, and train lots of uh, consultants for a uh, healthy living style. Uh, uh, so it looks like very nice uh, combination. Uh, you even finish here, or you finish in Matenson School that was introduced, and then you can start uh, do fit challenge uh, mission, and you can be uh, part of the very huge movement that uh, could uh, that uh, that will bring God's world to to the people that really need it. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your time and an effort to show us uh, your mission and. Uh, what, what what should what should we say? I think we should we should just praise God that He's uh, moving this um, movement forward. Uh, we will we will praise Him with a song. We will sing two songs right now, and then we will pray for that. So please, musician, come up front. We will sing uh, two songs. One is the theme of the theme songs of the conference, and one uh, song number. 219. <laughs>
Dear Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much that you have people out there that are putting their hearts into the mission, that are reaching others. I want to ask you that you may continue to bless these ministries that have been presented. I also want to ask you that you may help us at the places that we are at, that you will use us to be missionaries and that you will reach other people through us. I want to ask you especially now that you may be with Simon, that you may put your words into his mouth. Help him that he can share what he has on his heart and that we can have an open heart and open mind to receive it. Thank you so much for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let me introduce uh, Simon Carson, who is uh, who has a message for the uh, for this Sabbath ending time. Uh, the title is "Rest and Regain Your Focus," and to, uh, and he will share it not only by himself but also uh, with uh, his wife Julia. Uh, I have one more announcement uh, for those who are online uh, and they are speaking in Slovak or Czech language. There will be a uh, channel room that is uh, uh, directly for them. The, this message will be translated into that language. So, Simon, what is yours? Thank you. Let's see the the sound works. Everyone can hear me. Yes, that's good. Uh, yeah, I have to start to say it's been a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend so far. I, I'm amazed about this beautiful weather as well. Uh, I've asked several times, is the weather always this nice here in, in at TGM? And uh, most of the time, yeah, I've heard people say, yeah. <laughs> it's almost too hot for us, Swede, northern Swedes. We're not used to this really hot weather, but it's been fantastic. And uh, I've enjoyed many nice lectures and conversations with people. And the topic we will talk about tonight, uh, rest and regain your focus, is probably maybe the um, content that I'm most passionate about. And it's actually um, some personal stories I will share tonight that I have never shared like this before. So uh, I hope that the focus will be right and, and, and uh, it's a special wrestling experience with God that I went through a year ago that I will, that I will tell about. And, um, I hope it can be an inspiration and and uh, and uh, something that we can um, take inspiration from because I think we live in special times. I think that God has a special work for each one of us. And uh, I want to start to um, ask you a question. I like to ask questions. Uh, Jesus was a master of asking questions. You know, he usually when he got a question, he answered with a question back. So uh, the first question I want to ask you: What life goal? has God given you? I believe that everyone, each one of us, has a specific purpose and God has a specific plans for us. And uh, I think when we look back on our life, I think if we look back on our maybe our, our years before this year, we can see God's leading. It's much easier to look back on our life and see God's leading than to look forward. But I think it's a good question to ask ourselves. What do I think that God wants me to do in my life? And another good question to ask yourself is, what do I want to be remembered for? We only are promised today. We don't know about tomorrow. And uh, I think it's easy to be distracted. We live in a world where there's so much uh, stressors, there's so much things that takes our time. You've probably heard about a, a phenomenon that's called Facebook. Have anyone heard about that? Yeah, I see your hands on you. Yeah, and not so many have heard about it. <laughs> you have uh, YouTube, Facebook, and all these social medias that takes a lot of attention and time. And I think it's important to also reflect on this question. What is most important for you in your life? Um, I don't know if you've heard about a book called um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Can I see hands of you who have heard about the book? Yeah, how many have read, read the book then? 
yeah, a few of you as well. It's a very good book. I can highly recommend it. And uh, in that book, he talks about remembering the most important thing. Many times we are occupied with things that are fire fighting, more or less. We are turning down fires from one place to another place, and we forget this long-term thinking and, and what's really important in life. So I want you to start by imagining this concept of begin with the end in mind. When we do something or when we reflect on what we do on our days, to start to think about why am I doing what I'm doing? Is it just because it's always what I've done? Or is it what is the purpose of it? And a good way to think about this is to imagine that you are at a funeral, as you can see here. And you recognize the people, it's friends, it's colleagues, it's family, it's uh, business partners, or it's uh, long-time uh, childhood friends. And what shocks you is when you go towards the coffin and you see that it's yourself who's lying there. It's your own funeral. And you see all these friends and family members and, and all these colleagues of yours. And one by one you see them go up and speak about the impact you have made in their life. You see, first of all, one of your, your family members, and you hear a close friend of yours, a colleague at work. And the question I want to ask you is, what do you want these people to say about you? What is it that is important in your life? And what is it that you want to be remembered for? I think this mental activity can be helpful because it directly shows us what is really important in life. Begin with the end in mind. And um, I want to share a little bit of my own story. And uh, I jump 20 years. I, I don't share so much about my childhood. I, I was here on, on 2012. I was finished as a physiotherapist in the northern part of Sweden, a city called Umeå. It's a lot of snow there, not now, but uh, in the northern part of Sweden. And here is the graduation 2012 when I was finished a physiotherapist. And I felt that was something that God led me into. But uh, while doing the education and while um, doing practice and hearing what, what it was like working in this, I felt a strong urge that God wanted me to add something more. I didn't just want to work eight to four in a normal hospital at a normal physiotherapy, giving an exercise program and, and walk home and, and go back. I think that's a very meaningful work. But I sensed that God wanted something more for me as well. So during that time, when I was finished, God led me to some specific books. And I hope that some of you have read them, and maybe all of you have read them. The book, Ministry of Healing. Can I see how many have read that book? Yeah, it's nice to see. Amen to that. How many have read the other book uh, called Medical Ministry? Yeah, not as many, but you know about it. These two books I started to study and read carefully, and I felt more and more a desire to experience this kind of work. I felt that God called me to, do, to come into health work and, and have this holistic view of, of health. For those of you who are in the medical work, you, you, as a nurse or a physiotherapist or doctor or in that area, you probably know that it's not always the holistic view. You, you, you don't always talk so much maybe about how you eat and, and how you exercise and, and how you think and, and how your spiritual life is. It's usually more, yeah, it's more on what is your disease and this is the medication and this is good to think about. Um, it's not the holistic view maybe as we as Adventists want to focus on. And uh, at that time in 2012, it was a... Um, conference actually in Norway at the Madison School that we heard about earlier here tonight. And uh, it was a speaker, Jeremy's brother actually, Jesse Swicker, that maybe some of you know. And he had the title of the seminar or the, um, the conference was Finish the Work. And he shared the idea that in this generation we can actually finish the work if we just come together wholly devoted to God and work full time for God. And that sparked um, an even stronger desire that I wanted to do more of this kind of work. So it actually led us that summer that me and some of my friends, it's actually my sister to the left, and in the middle is Stefan, the co-partner of Alisher Fruit Farm now. He was also on the trip. 
and my cousin to the right as well there. And we went actually visiting the health center in Hergelia that probably a few of you have been at. Fantastic to, to see the work that they were doing. And later next year, I also went together with uh, Julie as well, before we were together, we went to um, the health center in, in Wildwood. And I felt the passion of learning more on this medical missionary concept. And uh, I've been talking to some here who's been doing the program uh, here at TDM, and I was thrilled to hear the stories, and, and it seems to be a very similar uh, concept of, m of mission focus here in TDM as it was in Wildwood. It was a very blessed experience when I went to that medical missionary training. I went there with a clear purpose. I wanted to see how do you do health mission, and, and more specifically, how do you run a health center, and how can you take that with you and do something similar in my home country. That was like the idea I had when I went there. I wanted to be involved in holistic health work in Sweden. Sweden had had a, a few health centers before, but uh, they were both closed down. And um, it was many of us who wanted to re-uptake that kind of work again. And um, so um, it was an experience that I'll never forget, the one and a half year in, in Wildwood. And uh, that led us to start some f the same summer as I went there. Uh, we, uh, me and a friend that actually is running Fredheim Health Center now, Frederick Lillebeck, is a physiotherapist friend of mine from childhood. He took over Fredheim um, at 2015, I think it is. Uh, we, together with some other friends, started a concept called Steps for Life. And it's, you could say it's a portable New Start Health Week. So what we did is more or less a new start program uh, for seven days where we actually rented uh, different facilities. We weren't on one place at the same time. We found a good locality and facility and we, we uh, what do you call it, we rented that place. And um, we did a similar pro program that you're doing here, holistic health. And this is actually the first team. I think we were around um, 15 to 20 guests and the same number of staff. And we had a fantastic week. Uh, I'll share some stories from that tomorrow. And um, this all or continued my passion and, and, and seeing the result of the health work really got me going on the, um, on the topic. And it was a fantastic experience being involved with this. Also in Wildwood, actually, um, me and Julia uh, was becoming closer and closer friends. And actually, after one and a half year, three weeks, before I left Wildwood, we became a couple, and um, and uh, yeah, we are married now. And uh, you have met our youngest daughter, and uh, it's quite interesting to see the timing. When I came to Wildwood, I was very focused on finding my life calling, like uh, developing my mm, skills and to know how to do mission to God. I think I read 30 books on leadership and health the first year. But towards the end, I started to read some relationship books as well. So I, I developed my interest in different ways. <laughs> and uh, after Wildwood in 2014, I actually went to this beautiful place that we saw on the video before, uh, Madison Mission School. And together with Frederick and Jeremy and uh, Jonathan in the middle of the year, we um, started this lifestyle club concept that we mentioned a little bit in the video, where we wanted to make a health club for the church and for the community where we could reach people in a holistic health way. So uh, I was part of that project and it was a very interesting experience and, and uh, learned a lot from it. And I'm very thrilled to hear that they still are running the health club in Norway and uh, it's connected to the Granheim Foundation and the Mission School. Um, so that was in 2014. And during that time, I got a phone call from my cousin and Stefan that we saw earlier. And uh, he had started a project, a holistic project on, um, in Sweden. And uh, it was with uh, a gym and some uh, fitness testing and uh, fitness coaching and um, in, into exercise quite a lot. And he asked if I wanted to join as a physiotherapist. And at the same time, we were, he was interested in buying Alisher Fruit Farm because the owner, we knew him a little bit and he was 82, 83 years old. And um, it was actually part of, um, uh, what do you call it? He was not owning it himself. It was a foundation, you could say. But he was the head of the foundation. And uh, 
with his age, they lacked leadership to take it over. So Stefan was interested in buying it. And uh, we said that, yeah, we are also interested. So it ended up that we bought the farm together in 2015. And me and Julia, we moved from Norway, beautiful Norway, back to my home country of Sweden. And that was in 2015. And uh, when I reflected on my life, um, I sensed that God called me to, to work, go into physiotherapy. And I sensed that God also moved me beyond that, and he wanted me to invest in medical missionary training. I started to read book, books on it, and it gave me a vision of doing something more. And I went to Wildwood to get training in that concept. And the Steps for Life Health Weeks was actually the, the practice part. We got the training in Wildwood, and here was the experience, the experience as many of you are doing here with your health work. And uh, also at that time, also God led me to find my life partner and best friend, and that also share the same vision. So uh, it's very interesting to see when you have lived part of your life and you can see God's timing and everything. I think I wasn't ready to find a life partner back here. So God wanted me to get these experience and these training before I was ready for the next step, so to say. And Madison and the Lifestyle Club was also a very blessed experience that, that taught me very much. And then he has called us now to all share the fruit farm where I will share a little bit more tomorrow also what our future plans for that place. But we want to have live God's vision on that farm together as a team. But you probably experienced that. Life with God is usually not always a uh, thing like this. Sometimes it goes up and then it goes down and then it comes up and down. And I would lie if I would say that my, my trip with God would have been like this. It's been a lot of up and downs. And I'm going to share a little bit about that. But I want to first also ask you to reflect on your life. You probably have a similar um, uh, high points where you can see how God has led you. And my question is, why, where is God leading you right now? I mean, it might be that you are in the middle of the training or experience, or you are maybe creating the vision, or you maybe have worked in your God's vision for many years. But I think always, God always wanna develop us. We are never finished. Uh, I meet a lot of retired people as a physiotherapist, and sadly or luckily in God's work, when do you retire? <laughs> never. Do you retire when you come to heaven? No, I think you never retire. We will always be involved in God's work. And uh, as we've heard before, working is good for you. Um, so where is God leading you? In Psalms 37, uh, 23... The Bible says, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. God is interested in our details in our life. But, yeah, as life moves on, <laughs> it's actually a picture of me on, uh, on the farm a few years ago, or two years ago. I actually started to get some health problems. And um, Lyme's disease, you probably have all heard about, uh, the ticks that bite, and uh, you get this uh, big red ring around the, the bite. And um, a few months after I got that two years ago, or three years ago, I think it is, I started to get some other symptoms as well. And um, one and a half year ago, uh, during Christmas, I got quite severe pneumonia and uh, was quite bad, I couldn't exercise for a long time. I got very easily recurrent colds, I got sick all the time. I was yeah, uh, getting well and then I got sick again, and, and, and sick and well and sick and well. It was a lot of these issues. Uh, I started to get some pain in my chest, in the, in the joint here, and when I stretched myself or breathed, I could feel there was something there, like it was like a, yeah, a bad feeling in there. And uh, at that time as well, I had very little energy. I could be super tired all day, and uh, no matter what I did, I had this thick tiredness in my body. And uh, consulting with some uh, doctors uh, that I had confidence in, I also worked a lot with this, it was a lot of 
symptoms that was probably a Lyme disease, what I thought at the time. And I tried some herbs and, and also tried, um, yeah, you probably see what this is, is a uh, yeah, the fever therapy. How many have tried the fever therapy? It's very tough, isn't it? I think when I was at Wildwood, uh, we did that a few times. I think I managed to get my body temperature up to 40.5 or something like that. And uh, yeah, it was really tough. For those of you who don't know how it is, it's that you lie in a bathtub with hot water. And you increase the temperature of the water all the time. You have a cold cloth here and you drink a lot of water and you take the temperature. And the, the, um, the purpose of it is to, to heighten your core temperature. Because uh, science, uh, the, the theory is that when you raise your temperature to a high fever, it supposedly should uh, Im uh, kill yeah, the Lyme disease and certain cancers and it improves the immune system very much. So they've done studies when they see that the, the white blood cells is much more active and more in, in, in uh, numbers. So it's a very, Im uh, very um, good way of increasing the immune system, so to say. And it's used to boost it and to treat some diseases. So I did a few treatments of that and um, that was also an uh, experience in, in, in itself. During this, this time as well, I felt that my spiritual life was not maybe up here. It was maybe more of in a, uh, somewhere here. So I felt a spiritual decline and these kind of health problems. And my focus was not maybe in the right place. And um, afterwards now, I could see that God probably was screaming or yelling for my attention. I think it's a good quote. We do, we do not pray so that we can get God's attention. We pray so that God will get our attention. And um, that was what happened to me. These health problems actually got worse. And uh, I could still work. But uh, I was talking quite a lot. And uh, while working as a physiotherapist, sometimes I lost my voice completely. I couldn't speak, I had to go out and drink water and try to cough and, and get this away. So it was, it was not a good situation, it was very, very tough. And um, uh, I had this intense coughing and, 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 and problem with my airways and it wasn't good. And I'd, yeah, I tried a few things and, and tried to see why I had these things and I, I knew I ate good and, and tried to exercise and take care of my health. But nothing seemed to really work. So God convinced me to try a last resort. And usually when, when uh, a last resort is usually something that is not so enjoyable. And um, that's what I'm going to share a little bit about. But for first, I, for before I do that, I want to ask you also a question. Is God trying to reach you? Maybe not on the iPhone or on the phone, but I don't know if anyone recognizes yourself that have you felt or do you have you felt sometime that you have lost maybe your passion for Jesus as you had before? Or have you, as we talked about before, have you allowed tistles or uh, to suffocate your spiritual life? Or do you feel that you need to get a spiritual revival? You may have been active in the church before, but you have lost your passion as you had back in the days. Or maybe have corona or other worries and anxiety maybe affected your spiritual life. Or have you lost your first love for Christ and you want to rejuvenate your relationship to Christ. I hope what I will share now will give some inspiration in these aspects. And um, I'm going to ask you a question first to see if you can guess what the common thread is with these kind of people. What, what would you say that Esther, Daniel, Jehoshaphat, Jesus, Nehemiah, Joel, and Esther, and Jonah, and probably a few more, but what do these people have in common? Anyone who, who dare to do a guess? Yeah? They risk their life? Yeah? Absolutely, that's, that's, uh, that's very true. But, but that's not the, the common thread I was looking for. So uh, you have to make another try and see if you find the one I'm thinking about. Huh? Yeah, who said that? Yeah. 
<laughs> That's a good guess. It's, uh, it's actually correct. Um, you know Esther, she, what she did before went into the king and she risked her life, as you said. But before she risked her life, she fasted for three days and prayed. And her whole people did it. Daniel, you probably know, in, in Daniel chapter 10, he was fasting a, a raw, raw food diet, so to say, in 21 days uh, in Daniel 10. Jehoshaphat that we're going to look a little bit more on is a powerful story on, on fasting. Jesus, of course, fasted for 40 days. Nehemiah and Ezra, they did that as well. And Joel and Jonah is not as common, but they also talk a lot about this. And this quote that I'll read now, I didn't read this one before I decided to do this, but I read it during it, and I could sense that God, this was what God called me to do. Ellen White, she writes in The Great Controversy that we must take time to pray, and if we allow our minds to become so absorbed by worldly interest, the Lord may give us time by removing us our idols of gold, of houses, or of fertile lands. And uh, at that time, yeah, we all have things that we love to do. It can be things that maybe is good, there can be things that is bad. But sometimes our hobbies or interest will suffocate everything else. Sometimes we might be so occupied with work or with, with um, a hobby or with a church project maybe even, that it takes away our time to pray and seek God. And uh, for me, two things that I enjoyed very much, as I mentioned, I think, two days ago. One of them is exercise in different types of forms. When I was young, I played a lot of table tennis, a lot of cross-country skiing, a lot of other different type of exercises. And I work with recommending people to exercise, so I'm not against exercise. Exercise is wonderful. Uh, but sometimes even a good thing can become too much. And for me, it was like this. This year, one and a half year ago, I was preparing to go for Vasaloppet that I mentioned about, a long, the longest ski run in Sweden. And I was very frustrated with my health that I exercised and tried to prepare for it and then got sick. And then exercise got sick. So it ended up that I couldn't do it. Um, and my interest was quite absorbed in these exercises. And other thing I love a lot is delicious food. Who doesn't love delicious food? <laughs> Do you know what the first sin, the, the first temptation for Adam and Eve, what was that? It was food. And what was the first temptation of Jesus? And what do you think the first temptations in the end time will be? Yeah, it's food. It's the desire of, of appetite. Ellen White wrote it, writes it herself. Even healthy food can be a temptation or, or an interest. So what God did while calling me to do this, this fasting was that he was more or less removing two of my biggest, biggest interests, I would say, uh, f delicious food and exercise. Because when you don't eat, when you fast and pray, yeah, I can tell you it's not so easy to exercise and um, you can't eat because then you're not fasting. So that's it's a given. Um, so this was a last resort, but I felt that God led me to this. And... Um, I started to study, actually, I, I, every Bible text I could find on Eastward to see what does the Bible actually say about fa fasting. Because I was amazed that we talk so little about this as a church, uh, but I was amazed that the Bible talks so much about it. So, so I was surprised that we don't talk about this more. Um, and I was studying this, and uh, it was a real blessing. And um, I was convinced by God that I, I felt that this is what God wants me to do. At the same time, I started reading scientific books on the topic. And uh, this is a very old book, The Science and Fine Art of Fasting. It's a guy named um, let's see, Dr. Shelton. I think he lived in the 1930s, 40s. And uh, maybe a few of you have heard about him. He, uh, it was quite amazing to hear about the fast he's doing at his lifestyle centers, where he have fasted people only on water for 10, 20, 30, sometimes 40 days. And he shares stories of people actually done up to 90, 80, 90 days of only water. And I was quite amazed. I didn't think you could survive that long with only water. Uh, another book that made me a big influence was Joel Furman's book. Uh, it's a doctor in, in America who is a lot for plant-based diet. But he also uses uh, water fasting for some of his patients. And um, 
one of my big motivation was my health problems and I read a lot about how diseases that is hard to treat or if you want to really detox your body that a cleanse and a fast is, is very effective. And um, I was convinced that I would do a, a 15 day of water fast with a spiritual emphasis because I felt that as big as my physical problem was, I felt that my spiritual decline needed to regain my focus. Uh, so this happened actually in, in March 2020 and uh, you probably know what time that was. You, I don't know when Corona hit Austria, but this was the time in Sweden at least when uh, regulations started to happen and when yeah, the Corona was spreading in the beginning, so to say. And uh, yeah, I want to share some of my blessing of this experience. And uh, I want to point out directly that this is all to the glory of God. I, uh, I don't want to focus anything that I did something. Uh, what God taught me during these 15 days was how bad I was and how good God is. And um, I think that attitude is very important when you do things. I think the motivation for doing things is, is like the most important. And uh, when I started this fast, I don't know if God wanted to trial me because during this time I went on a, um, a course of my physiotherapy studies uh, to develop some more program, so to enhance my education. I went and visited a cousin uh, in outside Stockholm and uh, I was going to sleep at their place for two days. And this was the first day of my fast and uh, the wife of my cousin, she had made delicious homemade newly baked bread. <laughs> so when I came my first day there on the fast, I could smell this fantastic uh, smell, as you can see here on, on, on the bread. So, but I, I had decided, and by God's grace, I, I didn't fall for the temptation. But I could see that God wanted to test my sincerity in this. Um, also on this, this course that I did, it was an exercise test where you should go up and down to see like a, a heart rate test. And uh, I did that on the third day, and that was maybe not the smartest, because I got quite energy. My energy was not the best after that, I could say. Um, but God gave me grace, I would say, because at that time I worked quite a lot. And during this fast, I was also working. I, di I didn't have the possibility to, to leave work. And usually I have between 12 and 15 patients a day. And uh, that works on a day when you are a lot of energy, but when you're fasting, it was not the easiest. But I think God had a plan for me. So Corona actually came in the beginning, and then a lot of unbook, a lot of people, uh, yeah, they, they, um, what do you say, they, yeah, yeah they cancelled their bookings, so to say. So uh, and during that time, I usually had only maybe six to eight patients instead of the double. So it gave me some more energy, and I could see that God was leading in many ways. And during these days, I was resting a lot, I was thinking a lot, and I was reading a lot, and I was praying a lot. Uh, I felt a need of coming closer to God, and I felt a need of, of developing my spiritual life. And on the fifth day, for those of you who have fasted, I don't know how many of you have done any type of fast, a juice fast, a water fast, or something like that. Yeah, uh, quite many of you, then you know what I'm talking about. The first two or three days, you're very hungry. After day three, when you do a water fast, the hunger disappears more or less. You're not hungry in the same way, but you still want food, of course. But on the fifth day, I studied the story of Jehoshaphat. And um, during this fast, I was studying the Bible and praying a lot, and I was studying every text I could find on the Bible in, uh, about fasting. And this is probably one of the stories that fascinated and gave me a most strength on this on this experience and it's not a very well known experience but the story about Jehoshaphat made a big impression and I hope you will get inspired by it a little bit of background Jehoshaphat was the king and uh, of Judah and uh, Moabites and the enemies of God was conquering uh, Judah and they were they were gonna attack Judah and they were much stronger and had much more power than Jehoshaphat and his army had. So he, he got scared, of course, frightened. What should I do? And what do you usually do when you have a problem and if you believe in God? Yeah, you pray and you come to God. And that's actually what he did. 
Jehoshaphat, you can actually turn with us because we're going to read from this story quite a lot. If you turn with, with me to the Bible in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, this story is amazing. So I can highly recommend to go home and read and study and pray about this story uh, afterwards. It's one of my favorite stories now in the Bible. If we jump into verse 3, we will jump around a little bit. Jehoshaphat says like this, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast through all Judah. So Jehoshaphat got a big problem. He couldn't solve it himself. And what did he do? He proclaimed a fast throughout Judah. And um, if we read on, the whole people, they gathered, and the families and everyone. And in verse 9, he says, If when evil cometh upon us, as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine. Pestilence, it sounds like corona, doesn't it, almost? It's the same, the same thing. Uh, and this I read in the start of corona. Uh, or famine, we stand before this house, and in thy presence, um, for thy name is in that, this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, that thou will hear and help. They sense their need. They saw that we cannot solve these problems ourselves. It's impossible for us. So they really came to God in fasting and praying, and they asked God for help. And what I think is amazing in this story is the response that the Lord gave them. If you jump down to, to verse uh, 15, and I read from the New King James here, and it says, And he said, Listen, all of you, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Imagine now, I'm in the fifth day of this water fast and reading these words, and I feel that God clearly says that you, Simon, you're not going to heal your disease by doing this water fast. It's not going to heal you, but I will fight for you. If you do your work, your work, I will fight for you. And this is exactly what happened in Jehoshaphat. Be not afraid. The battle is not yours, but God's. We need to figure out that we cannot help ourselves. We need to trust that God will fight for us. And if we go a little bit further down, in verse 17, it's an amazing verse. It continues like, You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. So you think about this army in Judah, they were going to be attacked by an enemy that's much stronger than them. And God says, don't be afraid. I mean, they have every reason to be afraid. An army who want to kill them is coming. But God says, don't be afraid. The battle is not yours, but God's. And what I'm mostly amazed about in this story is not actually this, because I know God can do a lot of things. But do you remember the response of Jehoshaphat? You remember what he did? Did he stand there shaking, like, and just want to watch what will happen? Like, I hope God, was, I hope God is doing what he's promised to do. I hope he, his promises still is, is, uh, is um, good. Was that what happened? What did he say? Yeah. He was singing, as you can see on the pictures. If you go down to verse 21, this is an amazing verse. Um... In 21 it says, And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of his holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. I mean, if this would have been... I mean, was this before or after the fight? Yeah, uh, wouldn't it be logical if you have won a fight, if you uh, watch like soccer or something or football or whatever you, the, the sport they do, uh, usually the winning team, they get to sing the national, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, the national song or what you say. Uh, but here you can see they are singing praises to God before God has done what he promised to do. 
Isn't that quite amazing? God hasn't done what he was supposed to do. They just heard the voice that God will fight for you. And before God has shown his power, Jehoshaphat says, we will sing and praise the God, the Lord, because he will deliver us. And uh, I felt a strong urge that what I need to do in the middle of this trial, in the middle of this fast, is just to praise God. Praise the Lord, because he has promised that he will heal me, he will, he will revive my spiritual life. And this study of Jehoshaphat was really um, a positive experience that I could see that in a trial, seek God and fast and trust that God will do the fight for you. It's very biblical. And in the end, this was an amazing experience. Um, what I did during this fast, uh, because you cannot really exercise as I love to do, and I can't really eat. I got a lot of time because I couldn't exercise without taking short walks and so on. And I couldn't eat because I do the fast. I got a lot of time, and that's wonderful. And uh, so I read a lot in the Great Controversy. And uh, it was amazing to read the, the last half of the Great Controversy, wh when you can read about the end time and what will happen. I read a lot in the Bible, studying the, every text on, on fasting, memorizing scripture, praying a lot. I read the books on fasting. And uh, believe it or not, you also get a, a nice passion for food. When you fast, you, you, you think about food sometimes. And uh, you're longing for the food. <laughs> so I made bread and different spreads and, and got actually a new passion for, for food and making food while doing this fast. So I don't know how many people have problem of appetite or don't like food. I can recommend the fast just for the, um, uh, for the inspiration of eating food afterwards. Uh, and one of the maybe the most blessed experience was during nights I could hardly sleep because you sleep much less when you fast. Uh, you're not, you feel so refreshed, you don't have to sleep as much. And your mental capacity increases probably tenfold. So you, you, you solve all the problems in the world and even problems that doesn't exist. <laughs> so uh, your mind is constantly going. I mean, sometimes you couldn't sleep hardly because you had so much mental energy. But, of course, there's also a tough part of it. And um, different days were harder and some days was more easy. But uh, there was a wrestling game with God, you could say. And um, when I came to day 10, 11, 12, there I felt really discouraged because I knew I had to work, I think, three more days before the fast would be over. And, and I saw that I had a lot of patience and, and, and I know it would be draining and I was unsure if I could do this because I had very little energy for one day there. And I started really pleading with God and like also having a little bit of complaining spirit. I felt, God, why did you lead me to do this? Can't I stop now? I've done uh, 12 days already. It's, uh, and I felt quite discouraged and, and, and I felt the need that I have to really wrestle with God, come to God for power. And the experience that I will share shortly was probably maybe the most uh, amazing experience I had during the whole fast and maybe in my whole life in a way. Um, but first, I want to read some quote that I read in the Great Controversy while doing this fast. And it really made an impact on me. And uh, in general, Great Controversy, page 616, uh, Ellen White likens the end time experience that we as God's people will have with Jacob's time of trouble. And uh, she says that Jacob's night of anguish when he wrestled in prayer for deliverance from the hand of Esau represents the experience of God's people in the end of time or in the, end, in the time of trouble. And I could really feel that I did something similar in a way that I felt that I was wrestling with God in prayer for deliverance because I knew that I couldn't do this myself. And I needed God's power. And it was the same with Jacob. He knew he couldn't do this himself. And he wrestled with God. And he continues, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me, was Jacob's word. What confidence, what firmness and perseverance was here displayed. Had this been a boastful, presumptuous claim, Jacob would have been instantly destroyed but this was the assurance of one who confesses his weakness and unworthiness. Yet trust the mercy of a covenant-keeping God. So you could say this was a, a very clear, it was like a wrestling game, a spiritual wrestling game in a way. And he wasn't boastful, it was an honest searching. 
And um, for me, it felt a little bit similar that I, I really had to work with God and like plead with God to help me in this type of crisis. And uh, the last quote I will share on, uh, on, th on this is a long one, but this is probably the best one. And uh, it says, this, the season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger. A faith that will not faint through severely tried. The period of probation is granted to all to prepare for that time. And here's the high point. Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. This wasn't just something he did a few minutes. This was really determination. His victory is an evidence of the power of importunate or uh, prolonging prayer. I don't know, what, what's a synonym to importunate? Persistent is a good word. Yeah. Persistent prayer. All who will lay hold of God's promises as he did and be as earnest and persevering as he was, will succeed as he succeeded. Isn't this an amazing power, uh, promise? If we are as earnest and persevering as Jacob, we will succeed. Those who are unwilling to deny self, to agonize before God, to pray long and earnestly for his blessing, will not obtain it. Wrestling with God, how few know what it is. How few have ever had their souls drawn out of the God with intensity of desire until every power is on the stretch. When waves of despair, which no language can express, sweep over the suppliant, how few cling with unyielding faith to the promises of God. Isn't this an amazing quote? This is the experience that we as God's people will go through in the end time. And during this fast, it was actually what I felt a little bit like. And um, at this time, I was very discouraged. And I felt like, God, you have to give me power. I was kneeling. I was crying. I was like really feeling unworthy of this. And I felt that, God, you have to help me. And I was uh, very down. And I felt this sense like, okay, Simon, read the Bible. I knew that read the Bible is good. And uh, I felt that God urged me to, before going to bed, that I, I should read a little bit more in the Bible. And this is where I felt the biggest encouragement throughout the whole fast, I would say. God led me. I was actually reading the Bible from the beginning to end, and the chapter I was actually on for that day, or for, for that time, was Psalm 103. And I think I've never seen God speaking to me so clearly as when I read this psalm. Because you have to remember, I was going through a tough experience. I felt exhausted. I felt um, lack of energy and power and unworthy. And I was quite complaining to God that you have to do something, God. And you know what God told me? I started to read this. In this, I felt sorry for myself situation. What did God tell me? What did he say? Feel sorry for yourself, Simon. Was that what he said? <laughs> No, I mean, it was such an eye-opening experience. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And uh, it was so many bless, bless, bless. I was almost like, it was, it was so clear for me. What I needed to do was to think less of myself and less of my problems and just give it to God. Just bless the Lord. Just praise him in the middle of my troubles. And it continues also, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all the benefits, um, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. And remember, one of the motivations I did this was my health problems. And I felt that God spoke to me here that he will heal all my diseases. And he forgiveth all mine iniquities. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And I jump around a little bit, and you see, Bless the Lord, ye his angels. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts. Bless the Lord, all his works. In all places of his dominion, bless the Lord, O my soul. And yeah, I can't really describe the experience that went through my head, but I fell down into tears, and uh, yeah, I couldn't do any other thing than just bless the Lord, more or less. And I felt this incredible peace that I knew that God would give me power. And uh, I found this quote by Mother Teresa, and she says, The more you forget yourself, the more Jesus will think of you. 
And I think that's a lot of truth in it. Mm -hmm. And I think the more you forget yourself, the happier you will be. And I think the more you forget yourself, the more God can work in you, so to say. Um, this was day number 12 of my fast. And uh, I could say probably the best day of my fast was probably the day after. This was um, day number 13. And um, as this quote is saying, forget yourself by becoming interested in others. Do every day a good deed that will put a smile on joy or joy of joy on someone else's face. And this day I was working, because this was a Monday, and God taught me this lesson before, that you used to praise God, and I could say that this day I have a lot of energy. I don't know how it happened, but God gave me the energy. And God also gave me abundant blessings in, in my patience for that day. Uh, my energy level was very high. I mean, uh, compared to the day before, they were like tremendously high. I think it was the highest of the whole fast. I had so much energy that day. And what's more, when you do say the same thing every day, even if it's such a fun thing like gardening, sometimes your passion maybe can go down. And uh, I felt that my job as well, that I hadn't the passion as I had before. But for, our, for these days, after this experience, my passion for my work, I mean, it was like never before. And uh, my patients probably could notice it as well. And because of Corona, I usually have half an hour for a patient, but now I had one hour for many of them because uh, I had so much more time because many canceled. So I could take more time and speak to people. And during these days, I actually uh, inspired two patients to, to change to a plant-based diet. And I think one or two of them also was inspired to do a water fast or a cleansing fast, not as long as I did, but for a few days to, to detox their body and change their lifestyle. And I could really sense that God was leading me throughout that day. And day number 14 and 15 was also very good. And the last three days of the fast was probably the best ones. And uh, my drive and energy levels were much higher. And uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm most happy about uh, after the fast and towards the end was that the closer you come to God, the more you think of others and the less of yourself. And uh, I had some church members that I had, um, was friends with, but I hadn't, I hadn't such a special passion for them to help them, but they had some health needs. And I just sensed this Holy Spirit calling on me like to start to pray for these people and to help them. So I, I actually visited them and, and, uh, and uh, trying to help their, their health needs. And this burden, to, I started to get a burden for different type of people that I hadn't had a bad burden for before. And this, I think, is the Holy Spirit's kind of work that he puts a burden to your heart. And uh, that was one of the, the best experiences I had during the fast. Uh, the pain that I had in my chest was gone. I didn't have any more pain. Uh, my energy levels, I was drained all the time. I had no energy beforehand because of my health problems. Uh, I had much more energy and, and this tiredness that I could fall asleep almost any time was completely gone. And the best of all was my spiritual drive was on to the top, so to say. I was so passionate about my experience and also how God had blessed everything. And my energy in my work, my passion for my work was like high on the top as well. Uh, I mentioned before the mental clarity. And um, if you haven't done fasts like, fast like this, especially water fast after a few days, you, you sleep one or two hours less usually. And you wake up early in the morning and you're completely rested. I mean, many times you are drowsy and tired in the morning. But the mental sharpness you have is amazing. You don't have the physical energy, that's maybe super much, but the mental clarity. I can really understand now why Jesus went through a long fast before his temptations with the devil. Because he gave him the mental energy. And you can see also another example in the Bible with Esther, for example. She did the same thing. In important events in your life... I think you need all the mental clarity and the spiritual clarity that you can have. Um, and that's one of the benefits of fasting is that you mean all the blood that goes to your stomach to digest the food now goes to your brain. And that's what Ellen White says that to take important decision after a big meal is like the worst you can do. Because then you, you don't take good decisions. So um, uh, I can really see the, the, why the Bible talks so much about fasting and praying together. Because it gives you such clarity and such focus that you cannot get otherwise. 
And uh, this closeness to Jesus and this abiding experience that the Psalm 103 and the Josephat, Jehoshaphat experience was something that I, I still have very good uh, results of. And uh, yeah, you could say that I learned in a way to wrestle with God because in the toughest times it was very tough. But I could say with an honest heart that this experience was probably one of the best experiences in my own life when it comes to the spiritual blessings, but also one of the toughest experiences. So what God showed me in this was in the story of Jehoshaphat that God will do the fighting for me. And I don't have to do it, and God will do it. And he also showed me very clearly with this, Jehoshaphat, he praised God before he got the blessing. He also thought he praised God before God won the fight for him. I think that's super important to remember. Many times we wait to thank and praise God until after we have gotten the blessing. And um, in Psalm 103, that was what God taught me. Praise the Lord no matter what you do or no matter in what circumstance, circumstance you are. And I think this is a biblical theme. Uh, if you know uh, Philippians 4, 6 to 7, this is probably the, the Bible promise that I quote the most. If you quickly turn to Philippians 4, 6 to 7, this is a truly amazing Bible promise that I urge everyone to memorize if you haven't already done it. And if you think about that one, it's the same as the two above. In um, uh, Philippians 4, 6 to 7... Let's see if we find it here. It's probably one of my top three favorites in the Bible. And um, it says, um, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Do you see the, the, the point here? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. If we just thank God and let him know all our problems, he says, the peace of God will come. Not afterwards, it will come directly. So when we have a problem, we can always just give thanks to God and trust him and he will give us. And you know, Paul and Silas, what did they do in prison when they were in the midnight? Yeah, they started praising God and singing in the middle of prison. And you know what happened? They did it before they were released or after they were released? Before. Yeah, before. So we can see this theme in the Bible that when in the middle of trial and tribulation, praise the Lord. And that was probably the, the biggest lesson that God taught me throughout this fast. That when you are, have the toughest time, stop thinking about how sorry, feel sorry for yourself. Just praise God and he will deliver Remove, remove the focus from your own problem and let God give glory to him. I see the clock is running, so I'll go some quickly. I just wanted to show, I did some statistics on the fast that I had like my energy level, my mood, my spiritual health in a scale of 0 to 10, my mental clarity, my pain, and, and my weight as well. And uh, after 15 days, my energy levels were, were higher. My mood was much higher. My spiritual health was super much higher, I could say. Uh, mental clarity was on the top. Uh, pain was completely gone. I also lost around 10 kilos. Uh, but 25 days later, I was back to my normal weight. So this is not a, a weight loss program, so to say. It's, it's more of a detoxing and a spiritual program, I would say. But um, what I'm most happy about is actually these two, the spiritual health and the mental clarity that really got a fantastic experience. Um, uh, I think I'll skip that one, yeah. Um, and uh, Julia will also now share a story and uh, share an experience that also was very powerful. I'm just going to share uh, one particular experience. And uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, you could perhaps turn with me to Hebrews 4. where it says, a promise remains of entering his rest, in the first verse. This, is, this chapter is one of my most favorite chapters. It's all about rest. And this is a promise for us. This promise remains. It remains for those who are here today. And 
It's for us. And God leads by example in verse 10, verse 9 and 10. It says that God rested. He ceased from his works after he had created this world. He ceased from his works as God did from his. We should rest just as he did. He leads by example. And in Ephesians 2, I'll just quote, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Walk, not run, not jump, not, not ski. <laughs> walk, walk in them. That, that to me sounds like a restful walk. It's, God has invited us to just walk with him hand in hand, to rest in his works that he has prepared beforehand. And then hopping down to the end of the chapter, this is the highlight, the highlight of this chapter. Our high priest, our sympathizer. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. I like to say that that God is the best psychologist. <laughs> he, he is the one that knows us the best. He knows everything about you. And who better to go to with your problems than someone who knows you in and out better than you know yourself. And he can, he can do amazing things for us that we cannot imagine. In this, day of, in this day and age of mental health problems that are so rampant everywhere, it is God that we can turn to, first and foremost. Uh, verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So this was my experience. I, here, I, uh, I experienced this psychologist God leading me hand in hand through his works that he had prepared beforehand that I could not imagine. Just, I just want to share with you, um, most of you, some of you know that I grew up in New Zealand. I moved to Norway when I was 17, um, together with my three brothers and my mother. And we, we stayed in Norway for several years, more than longer than we had expected, actually. And for eight years, I was longing to go back to New Zealand. I was really homesick, I thought. And I really wanted to go back. And finally, after eight years, we all managed to, we had all kind of started our own lives, and, but we managed to get together to go back together as a family. And when we had left New Zealand, we were not in the church. When we came to Norway, we, we had a spiritual revival that's another story, um, and we came back to the church, and we were eager to share this with our family back in New Zealand, our family and friends that we had left behind. And so we, we finally made our way back for a holiday. And we traveled around the whole country with my father, who was still there, and visited his family, who, who's from New Zealand. And we went to my grandmother's funeral and shared, shared our testimony with my father's nine siblings and their children, all of our cousins, and how God had led us. And we were singing for them and had a worship at, at my grandmother's funeral. They are not Adventist. And, and it was an amazing, amazing holiday that we had together um, for, for, I think it was at least a month, uh, a little bit over a month. And this was in 2012. Um, 2011-12. The summer in, in uh, New Zealand is the opposite from here, so we were there in December. And towards the end of our trip, we went back to our hometown where we grew up. And there, we really wanted to be able to share how God had wrought so much grace in our lives. So we had the Sabbath service in our, in our church where we were as children. And all of my my teachers from primary school were there 
and uh, we were sharing how God had changed our lives and we sang songs and my brother had the sermon, he's now a pastor. And it was just an amazing ex experience. Then after church we, we ate together and like we do in New Zealand, we went to the beach. <laughs> it was a hot day. And we were at the beach where we would swim as we were, grew up. And it was, it was a beautiful day. It was a little bit rough in the waves, actually. Uh, there was a, a current. I can't remember the name, or what you call it. Um, yeah, we had bodyboards, my brothers and I. And so we were out swimming on our bodyboards. And, but my mother, she, she didn't have that. Uh, she went out into the water, and I saw her from a distance. I saw that she was going out, and I didn't think much of it. I knew that it was a little bit of a current, but she's a good swimmer. And she, yeah, we were always swimming here. We grew up here. And that was the last time I saw her. Sorry, <laughs> I haven't talked about this for a while. In front. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so when I went out again, my friends, my childhood friends, they were asking, "Where's your mother? We haven't seen her for some time." And we, we didn't know we were out swimming. So we were all looking all over the beach. And none of us, none of us wanted to think that she was in the water, water because there were waves. It was rough waves. And, and we couldn't see her past the waves. And if she was there, then that wouldn't be a good sign, of course. But finally, we did. My brother headed out into the water. And he met a surfer on his, on his board. And uh, the surfer cried out that he could see a body floating in the water, head down. And so he, my brother, it was a tough experience for him. He dragged my mother into the beach. And then we, they were giving CPR, and, but it was, it was too late. A nurse actually came, a nurse that was just walking past. She, she was amazing. She did CPR on my mother, and my mother started th throwing up food. And she continued <laughs> doing CPR on, on her. And finally, the, the ambulance people came and, and took her away. So as you can imagine, this was a shock for, for us. And uh, we didn't really know how to handle it, of course. And, and, but we were together. And that was, that was important for us. My three brothers and my father and I, we, we, uh, we were together and we, we prayed and we just, yeah, we, we prayed. And during this time, this was just before I was supposed to go to Wildwoods, like Simon talked about. We were there in 2012. And, and uh, it was only four days before our flight was going to leave. And all this got canceled, and, and we got new flights. And, and uh, we, had, we had a ceremony in New Zealand, and then we had a ceremony in Norway. We went all the way back to Norway. But my younger brother and I, who were supposed to go to Wildwood, uh, we decided to go anyways, um, because we knew that this was what we wanted to do, and mom, our mother would have wanted it. Um, and I want to share this one experience, how God really led and helped me, because this is how, how God works with us. He's, he's the greatest psychologist. If we just come to him with whatever God, whatever life throws our way. So when I got to Wildwood, um, the first week there, we, we went to Friday evening meet, meeting. And I don't know if any of you know Pastor Atwood. He, he had the meeting every Friday. And what I enjoyed about his meetings was that he would always have an appeal, and he called people to the front, and he would always pray with them. And he actually spoke about Jacob's trouble at this meeting. And that really, really spoke to me, just like Simon mentioned here. 
And, and I went up, my younger brother went up to the front also, and we, we were both there, and he prayed, he prayed over us with several other people. And after this, I just took, uh, went away back to the dorm and locked myself into the bathroom. <laughs> and I, I really took this moment, and I, I came boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And I had an amazing experience. I, 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 I can only describe it in the way that I threw myself at God. I just threw myself at God physically, mentally, and everything. And he, he answered. He, he, I felt a physical embrace around me, a, a truly f felt a physical embrace. And he reminded me of the hope that we have, the hope that we have before us. And after this, this was just the beginning of my time in Wildwood. It was one of the most amazing times. Um, and just to name a few things, uh, music is a very important thing for me. And God used music in amazing ways. Every song I heard anywhere and everywhere was talking to me. And he even used it to tell me to do things. I was listening a lot to um, Naomi Jackson's music at that time. She is also, um, she was at UG Fine, sorry. What? Yeah. And yes, uh, there was a song, it was a very happy song, <laughs> but it it's was telling, it was saying that I need to give up. You need to give all you have. You need to give all you have to God. What if I give all I have? What would that do? It would change the world. It would change everything. And I just knew exactly what God was telling me. I needed to give up my mother to him. I needed to give it to him. Just not carry that burden, just give it. And, and after that, I, I felt such peace. I felt a peace that, that I couldn't, explain it was it was just that he he knew he knew the situation he knew my mother and he he took it into his hands he took me and my mother into his hands and i just gave it to him then he led me to many people there were several people my mother's uh, friends from college who she sang with songs about heaven he shared his music with me that I had never heard before. When she was the same age as me, 25 years old, she was singing with this guy about heaven and the hope we have. He shared all this music with me, and, and he was writing with me, and we still keep in touch today. He, he told me lots of stories about her. And, and uh, one day I was actually quite depressed, and, and I decided... I, I was a bit surprised that at Wildwood you couldn't take a bus anywhere. <laughs> you couldn't just go anywhere. So I actually decided to hitchhike because in New Zealand you just kind of do that. <laughs> and I hitchhiked to, to Chattanooga. But of course, there's like almost only Adventists living there. So it was an Adventist that picked me up. And it was the wife of the medical doctor, <laughs> like one of the leaders at Wildwood. Um, and I. I said I didn't want to get into the car, <laughs> and, but she basically made me, and she took me all the way to wherever I wanted to go, and she said she would pick me up and take me home after. And, and ever since we met, she really just took care of me as, as a kind, like a mother would almost. And uh, the whole time I was there, she was uh, really a mentor for me. So I just want to testify to that that if we just put our life in, in God's hands in these, in these tough times and in any time in our life, he, he will follow through. He will, he will be the sympathizer, the psychologist that you, you cannot know what, what he will do for you. He, he will just lead you, resting in his works, holding your hands and lead you the way that you need to go already even one and a half years later after my mother died he reminded me that i had a lot of baggage with my mother in our relationship actually and i needed to forgive her i needed to forgive her and just put it aside and i can say actually since i've had children i've forgiven her a lot more too <laughs> uh, so 
I, I forgave my mother and, and I just, I feel only love and, and, and warm, warm love for her. We had a good relationship too. Um, there's many more things I could say about how God led me in that time, but I won't go into that. And I just want to, to say I, I rested in the works that God wrought in me, and I grew so much in this time. I grew spiritually, and I grew closer to him. It was truly an amazing experience. And this verse, this last verse, Isaiah 30, 15, it it's sums up. For thus saith the Lord, God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And I hope we will. We would not. Thank you uh, for sharing. And uh, I'm sure many of you, all of you are touched by that story. And, and I think that illustrates what this rest in God really can be. And... Um, we're going to finish, but uh, I'm going to read this quote again. That's an especially the, we read it two days ago. And in the end here it says, um, What will thou have me to do? We need to humble ourselves before the Lord with fasting and prayer and to meditate much upon his word. We should now seek a deep and living experience in the things of God. We have not a moment to lose. I think depending, no matter what we're in life, if we're in a life crisis or in, in, in our lives, we need this experience with the Lord. And um, God gave us some renewed focus as well, as you shared. And uh, this is some of the future plans we have for the fruit farm. This is actually a, a map of how we hope that our new health and agriculture center will look like in a way. We will have, as you can see here, uh, like a small vegan cafe and a um, country store where we sell some products that we make on the farm. Here's the plan to have a hydrotherapy room and three different treatment rooms for massage and physiotherapy and a small little gym. Uh, so that's some of the um, prayer requests you can uh, pray for if you, if you would like. We, uh, we have these plans of developing our fruit farm to incorporate a holistic um, uh, holistic combination of, of agriculture and also with health work. So some of the things we have to hope to have in it is physiotherapy and plant-based cooking courses, different health weeks and health seminars, hydrotherapy, fruit and berries and, and vegetables, uh, beekeeping, some fasting and detox courses, uh, some plant-based farming, plant-based cafe and a plant-based country store. So by God's grace, he will continue these, these plans. I think we live in a time when we have to do things together. So that would be a nice prayer request for us. And to summary, what we have talked about tonight is to begin with the end in mind. I mean, what's your life goal? What is God calling you to do? We have to not be distracted by other things. What is your life all about? And uh, encouragement I would, that I've been blessed by is to actually study the Bible on fasting and prayer and see what God convinced you to do. I think that uh, if you want mental clarity and spiritual re rejuvenation, so to say, I know no other more effective way to getting close to God and to study and to, to fast and pray together. Um, but I would say motiva motivation and intention is the key. If I've had other people who have done similar fast, but if, it, if you don't have the spiritual, deep-seeking attitude towards God, it won't be the same blessing. And what I learned the most was praise God in your trials. No matter what you go through, I think God is speaking to us. Praise Him and He will help you go through whatever it is. And as Julia shared, to rest in God's work in a special way is also very important. And uh, a challenge for us all, I would say, is to wrestle with God, to get a deeper experience with Him. And in what way you do it, I think it's up to you and God. But a challenge could be to, to see what God says when you study the Bible on fasting and prayer. And to praise God and wrestle with God is something I think we all need. The last slide I have is like the prize. What is Christianity all about? And I think this is a, such a powerful quote in Steps to Christ. And a life in Christ is a life of restfulness. There may be no ecstasy of feeling, but there should be an abiding, peaceful trust. That's been Eula's experience and that's been my experience in, in wrestling with God. And I think it can be all of our experience. 
and Julia will, will finish with, with uh, singing a short prayer song, and then we'll finish with prayer. It's actually this, this verse here. Uh, my mother uh, received this verse when she left New Zealand as a promise um, that God would be with her. And she wrote a melody to the song. And I think at least the people here who have been at Matheson, they know it's where my mother used to work. And you're, I would like you to sing with me the second time. It would be nice. Mm -hmm. In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength in returning and rest shall ye be saved in quietness and confidence shall be your strength one more time in returning and rest shall ye be saved in quietness and confidence shall be Let's stand up as we pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and for all the experiences we have gone through. And we praise you, Lord, for all the reasons we have to praise you, even for trials and tribulation we go through. And uh, Lord, I pray that you will bless each one of us and that you can help us to really wrestle with you to get a deeper experience with you and i pray that we as we contemplate fasting and praying and and resting in you god i pray that you will guide each one of us to show us what we need to do to get this experience with you and i pray that you also show each one of us your life goal for each one of us and maybe a prayer and fast can help us to do that or maybe just to wrestle with you and, and your word can do that but we pray, good Lord, that you will guide each one of us to get this wrestling experience with you. Thank you for all the blessings and thank you for this conference and help us to have a good night's rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. To Simon and Julia for sharing their experiences with us. I think rest is what we all need. I hope that you guys got some rest today, that you got a, a peaceful, restful Sabbath. I hope you were blessed by it. I hope you were also blessed by spending some time with God in nature and I'm sure he taught many lessons to you as well. Thank you also to all the people that uh, joined online. At this point, I want to invite you back to come tomorrow at 7.30. We'll have a worship together with Stefan. So welcome back tomorrow, 7.30. For all of you others, if you would like to join the United Prayer tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock, please um, bring your shoes with you and you will meet in front of the entrance. More I'm not allowed to say, so I don't know what will happen, but uh, at 7 o'clock in front of the entrance with your shoes. Then tomorrow there will also be a, again an opportunity to buy some products here from the TGM shop at 8.30. So just for everybody who would like to still buy something at 8.30 the shop will be open until 9 o'clock. Then um, on kitchen duty is Elise and Doris, just for you to, 
to remember that. Um, I also have a question. How many of you plan to leave before lunch? The kitchen would like to know because they're making pizza and they would like to know how much. Uh, Don't want to leave. <laughs> 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 okay, so I guess all of you are staying. <laughs> so I can give a correct we number. We want the pizza. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Then um, tomorrow, before you leave, please leave your lanyards like these ones. Um, out there at the registration booth. We would like to collect them and gather, uh, have them for next conferences. But you can take out your card and take that with you as a memory. Okay? And the last announcement will be from Stefan. If you can come, Stefan. I don't have the blue box with me. But I wanted to share with you the result of our gift that we have packed together for Jesus. Um, we praise God. Quite a good number of participants have renewed their allegiance to Jesus, have given their heart to Jesus, which is one of the most precious blessings. That's the harvest that Jesus is waiting for the most delicious fruits that we can bring. But besides that, we have packed together 1,471 euro. We praise God. And yes, let us be also in the future mindful of our Creator and see the opportunities that we have to give him back of the bountiful blessings that he has given to us. I wish you a good night's rest, sleep well. May God bless you and give you a fresh awakening next morning. Good night. <laughs>